My name is Peter Beach. I've been on some of these uh, videos and it's been 17 years, right, Milt? 18 years. 18 since years since uh, we were, I was there the first time in the Forbidden Zone. Uh, I wanted to bring you up to date to some new information that we have that uh, and answer some of the questions and the comments to the videos that have already been shown. Uh, the, if you're familiar with this, this is the Forbidden Zone. If you're not familiar with this, uh, in uh, 2004, uh, myself, Brian Sass, and Pierre Sima, with the help of Milt Marcy, uh, went into Cameroon to find what they call Michele Membe, which is a dinosaur. Now, the Jaw River is the main tributary of the Congo in this area, and we went down the Jaw in a, a boat, a dugout boat called a Perot, made out of wood, and uh, landed on a beach that was this, this island. This water was about 20 feet below what it had been two or three months before when Brian had been there and actually seen or almost uh, saw the animal. He was in a canoe uh, in this area here between the island and actually the Congo Republic and uh, saw this animal near this dot right here and this dot right here is actually a snag and if you haven't seen the picture of the snag before this is a close-up of Brian this is the snag but if you get back you see this is the snag and the snag comes up here it is this snag is 20 feet above him here he is 20 feet well, the top of that snag is where the top of the water was. So the animal that was walking on this surface was about 20 feet. So its feet were on the ground where its head was above water when the canoe was in this general area. So he'd seen, or almost saw this animal. Uh, Pierre Sima stood up, the boat got a little rocky. The uh, uh, Bantu, who were with him, the fishermen in that area, it was their boat, uh, saw it. Uh, they got very frightened and uh, wanted out of there and they started paddling very fast to get out of here. This is an old story. If you haven't heard it before, that's the story. At any rate, they, so they paddled back this way. But we went back about three months later, as I described, and saw that snag, took that picture, and went into this area right in through here, which is more or less the center of the island. There were footprints here with a large dugout area, uh, dugout being meaning the vegetation was missing. It was sand basically through here, as if something had been feeding in this area, and I'll describe that later. And then there was bumps along the shore of the Congo, which turned out to be caves and I want to describe better what the caves were because there's been some confusion there. So that is the forbidden zone. The uh, river is running this way. It bends right about here and where there's a bend you usually have a buildup of silt and sand on the inside of the bend and that's why the island is here. When it floods 20 feet higher this whole island goes underwater. And these bumps, which are the caves, they go into water too. But we'll describe that a little in more detail later. Okay, uh, these caves that uh, you're talking about here, um, how big were they? Yes, there's some question. Comments have been made about what the, what the cave is. They seem to be a much smaller than what we described. I'll show you the picture that we were going by uh, the last time we did this video. Uh, there's a, an area described by these dotted lines and underneath the water that I called the cave. Yet when I started talking about the caves, I was talking about standing on the caves and digging out um, plaster casts of, uh, of the digging tool of the animal that was digging these caves. I wanted to give you a better idea of what the size was 
If you look here, you can see Pierre is holding a stick. That stick has been cut into three foot sections where you see these little notches. And if that was down in the water, this would be 15 feet from here to here. It's in a semicircle. I'm not saying that the cave is exactly 15 feet tall here. What I'm saying is that the cave is probably much smaller, maybe two or three feet smaller this way. And, and but is it being closed in as there the animal is closing the door so to speak of the cave it pushes out material and makes the cave look a little bit larger than it actually is here's a picture of what I'm talking about okay this right here is this right here this is the part that's above water. So that would be the part up here that's above water. If you can see, there's a, uh, a hole up here, or a dark area from your perspective. That is another hole, but it's inside this cave mouth. Okay, so the cave mouth, when the water's at this level, looks like this. You'll notice that it's semicircular, goes clear down into the water. The cave starts at the bottom of the, of the uh, channel. The channel is about four feet deep here. There's a, this light colored area is actually uh, a feldspar sandstone type of material that is dug out and then deposited and pushed out into the river. And this part right here is the very last it's kind of like uh, if you're pushing on sand at the very end, the part that comes out at the bottom of, of this hole, which is a smaller part of this cave, um, pushes out and creates kind of a, uh, a place to stand. It uh, goes out into the, uh, into the channel underneath the water and pushes out into a bulge right in here. This is the last part that is filled in when the cave is being closed in. So the cave is much larger. This is just what's left when they finally close the gate. How would they get ventilation for that inside of there? Okay, you don't see it on this picture because it isn't in, I didn't notice it on this particular cave entrance. But along the area, along the side here, on many of the caves that I saw, there were holes. I don't know how deep the holes went, but it was like there was ventilation all the way along here. There was also probably ventilation above. When I went back with Milt, was it three years later? Or two years later. Two years later, went back, this whole area had caved in. They had left the area and the cave had caved in. And I stood there and watched that cave in part and I could tell how large the, the hole was that this cave represented. And it was essentially uh, 12 to 15 feet of material down from where it was before and back, quite a ways back, at least 15 feet back from the area if you're standing right in here. This area was gone, this area was gone, and this whole part of the bank was caved in. So the creatures had moved by that time. The creatures had gone by that time. So there was ventilation in other places. I didn't see it here. There must have been ventilation somehow in the roof, I guess. There was also a hole right here. And that hole was the shape of uh, basically a football, but it was larger than a football. And as I imagined it, as some others have imagined it, it's, it looks like a, the tail of a dinosaur turned sideways. In other words, it's not like this, it's more or less like that. And so that's what we, that right there, I put a, um, a microphone and I put it in as far as I could put it up to my arm, about that deep, 
back into this this hole went all the way through and I I got down there and listened and also with the microphone I could hear that it was empty in there so this hole went all the way into the cave itself I could hear what sounded like slopping with the feet like this maybe I disturbed something didn't hear much of anything more than that slopping slapping um, water moving around in there but 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 the water was shallow very shallow it was like a puddle not like a pond uh, and what is this hole somebody has asked me is that the cave no that has a whole different story that goes with that and I'll get into that later do you have any more questions that's the cave no, I did want to ask you about the, when you were there you found that this material had hardened up considerably. Mm -hmm. um. Yes, it's, um, the material has a lot of feldspar and sandstone. This material is well known. It's a very common material, especially in, in Africa. This is, uh, the feldspar is a very hard material, but it's flakes. All sorts of flakes do this stuff. And with the sandstone, it sort of sets up like a, like a cement. It's not cement cement, but it's tough. But if when it's wet, it's soft. When it's uh, really wet, it's soft, but as it dries out, it actually hardens, more like a cement. Um, so, this material right in here, although you could dig it with a shovel, it was hard digging. You couldn't take a, a regular shovel and jam it into this material. It would just bounce off. You could jam it into this material, same thing, still too hard. But the animal had no trouble getting through it. It was like it was digging through pudding almost. It was a very, it's obviously a very strong animal. This area down in here was uh, somewhat wet. And so it did have a footprint. And so I got that footprint too. But that, it, that was some, not hardened, but it was um, firm. And then the material, of course, underwater is kind of uh, like uh, clay. It's mushy and, and um, sloughs off. So the caves are over here. They're pairs of caves. Each pair was one animal, we assume, from the, what the Baca tell us. And uh, this area is here where they were feeding on the Malumbo the plants that basically what they eat, they eat malumbo fruit and leaves. There are a pair of footprints right here. Now, this is what we put up before. It looks like a pair of footprints here and a pair of footprints here. Um, when I first saw this, I thought it was an animal that had uh, feet that were roughly uh, three feet wide. And uh, you can see here, the, uh, this Pierre standing in this footprint. But Pierre looked at it for a, a quite a period of time, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, longer than I would have thought because I thought it was obvious that this is one animal with a footprint here and a footprint here. But as he looked at it more closely, he said that's, that actually is three footprints. One footprint here that went with this footprint, this footprint went with this footprint, and this footprint went with this footprint. This is a picture of one of the footprints, this one, and you can't tell it from here, and I'll, I'll show you more detail. I redrew it simply by tracing this up in this corner right here. Uh, I used as a, a way of uh, comparing this picture with this picture, and so there actually was uh, an offset here. And I use these tracks up here as for registration. I, I made the registrations fit and then drew, using tracing, the, the pictures that I showed you before and what the pictures should look like if I drew them right. I think I did. So this foot, right foot was actually a little bit back from the left foot. This right foot one fits with the left foot one. Don't be confused by this P with the, with the red. That's the footprint of Pierre. I only put the footprints in there to give you a, a, 
an idea of the size of the footprints. And you can see that this footprint is not as wide as that footprint or as wide as that footprint. And this footprint is not as wide as that footprint and that is the widest footprint. The reason is that as, he, as the animal moved from here, it stepped on part of the footprint on this one and st then stepped on the far part of the footprint there. So as it moved over, it tended to step on its own footprints a little bit. Now, if you look very closely, and I got down with my head right, right next to the ground, and I looked at the footprints sideways, I could see that there were, there were heel pads and toe pads. That is, the place where the toes actually touch and push into the gravel, and where the heel of the uh, foot uh, hit the gravel, that it, it compressed the gravel to a point where it became smooth. Whereas the rest of the gravel around it was a little bit rough, there were smooth surfaces. Let me interrupt you just a moment. Uh, you say gravel. Was this material gravel or was it soil? Okay, good. This material was like the material on the other side, except it had a little more sand in it. Uh, you can see by Pierre when he's standing in it, he, make, he doesn't disturb the put footprint at all. You can't even tell when he steps out that he's been into the footprint. So it's like cement at that point. Uh, the water is only a few feet away from these footprints. And during the night it rains, water comes up a little bit. So it isn't that the water rushed over these, these footprints, it's that the, the water table kind of goes up and this gets a little bit softer. I think the animal when it came in was standing in somewhat moist ground. Also, wouldn't it, there be a factor that the animal would be much heavier? And by that oh, token, it would certainly make a deeper print. Of course. Of course. And when Pierre, after he looked at that very carefully, he has a, he's a tracker by trade, uh, as well as a, a translator and guide and many other things. He speaks 36 languages. Uh, and he's been trained in, in, in Paris, of all places. At any rate, he looked at that and he said, that's about a three-ton animal. And I had no way of knowing if he was close or not close. I'll get into that a little bit later. But three tons would be about 15, uh, would be about, what, 3,000 pounds here and 3,000 pounds here. So 3,000 pounds twice is three tons. And you can see it, uh, it makes a pretty good dent about that far into the ground. Of course it's pushing it up a little bit so maybe it's a little bit less but you can tell it's it's higher than his boot. His boot fits down into the picture. So the material like I said is uh, is not sandy, it's not it's not goopy, it's uh, dry, somewhat dry but m a little moist uh, but more like cement than anything else. It's a very tough material. You can see uh, a, a smoothed out area here and a smoothed out area here uh, and maybe a smoothed out area here. That is what we call the heel print or the heel mark. Um, there are not heel marks on the left side that I could detect, but there are heel marks on the right side. So these are the heel marks. There were also uh, pad marks for the toes here, 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 and here. You could tell that the uh, nails on the feet were somewhat curved over. They weren't out like a lion or a tiger uh, that you might imagine. They're more like uh, that, like my fingers are, whereas uh, the toenail is more down like that. So it digs in a little bit. The dimensions, 26 inches by 14 inches. Over here it was 13 inches, but about the same 26 inches, 27 inches, I say here. Uh, the stance, if you take from this middle of this foot to the middle of this foot, with the same sort of perspective, 56 inches wide, which means a dinosaur is a dinosaur because its, its legs go straight down. They don't go out like reptiles. They go straight down from the hips. So that means the hips are probably about 56 inches wide. 
the pelvis, the outside of the pelvis is going to be about 56 inches wide. Four and a half feet. Yeah. Here I describe it here as a, a splash zone. This is about roughly less than a foot to a foot from the edge of the water. This is the water. Uh, above it is dry sand. We saw lots of uh, what looked like foot marks. You couldn't really determine though because it was dry sand and it's kind of like a sandbox. After you, you walked in it a while, it just sort of looks like nothing but little bumps. Like there's nothing specific there. You can just tell that there's been a lot of activity there. So the sandbox uh, had a lot of a lot of um, footprints probably, but there was nothing that we could uh, use for defining what the animal was. And I want to reiterate that this water that we're talking about was when you were there. Right. Uh, it fluctuates throughout the year depending upon the, the rainy season and the dry season. And it fluctuates during the day. Every day is just a little bit different. Some days will be higher, some days will be lower. We were probably very lucky that we got the footprints that day. If it rains in the dry season, it rains every one-third or one-fifth. There's every five days, every three days, something like that. We were there, I don't remember it raining, it might have rained at night, but uh, we were lucky, the footprints were still there. And probably hadn't, the water hadn't rolled over them, otherwise they wouldn't have been there. One of the questions people give me is, uh, how do we know it was a dinosaur? I think that's a pretty good question. Well, here's some uh, footprints. They call them acataxons. That is, these are footprints, uh, the study of footprints. And uh, here's, a, for example, an iguanodon. I think the animal that we're talking about, the Michelemembe, is something like an iguanodon, but uh, this is what the iguanodon footprint typically looks like. There are foot pads, or there are toe pads here, and there's a heel pad here, three toes. This animal has three toes, three toes, three toes. Uh, Michelemembe here's uh, foot pad, three toes. The elephant basically has four toenails, but one big round fat uh, foot. Now I've written in here one foot, so these are all in the same perspective. That is, one foot is the same as the one foot over here. So what looks like it's four times bigger than that is four times bigger. An elephant footprint is about four times bigger than this. That's a pretty big footprint, but Pretty big elephant. Still, they're bigger and they look different. The hippopotamus is a big animal. It's in the area too. Could it be a hippopotamus? Well, that's what a hippopotamus footprint looks like and how big it is. It's smaller than these Michelemembe footprints. And they have four lobes, four toes. Uh, an apatosaurus. Uh, for a long time, people thought the animal, Michelemembe, was a sauropod. That is, it had four um, elephant-like legs, four elephant-like feet. That is what a, uh, an apatosaurus footprint looks like, a rear footprint. And you notice it's about the same size, maybe a little wider, uh, but its foot pads are different, its number of toes are different, four toes versus three toes. The spinosaurus was the closest footprint that I could find to it, of course, Michelemembe is not a, it's not a Spinosaurus, it's not carnivorous. It's a herbivorous animal. We know that for sure from wide witness accounts. Okay, so Michelemembe is about a foot wide. Foot printed is a foot wide and it's about two and a half feet long. The ones that we saw on the island. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to dis describe how I think. Now, some of these what I've talked to so far is science is repeatable. We know that's what a footprint looks like. We know this is the size of these things. These are footprints. These aren't uh, imaginations. Okay, But now we have to kind of use deductive reasoning a little bit. How are things done? So what I'm about to tell you now is not science. It's more, pers uh, 
my own personal opinion. This is how I think the animal digs the, its uh, caves. So it starts by digging into the, the cave where it's easiest to get to. That is, it's standing in the water and it starts digging out its cave. It will dig it out as far as it can reach and it starts dumping this material out into the river. As it gets back further, probably the same width as the, as the channel of this uh, cave, the width of the cave, it probably isn't 15 feet. It's probably less than that. The animal is not 15 feet tall when it, when it hunches over and works on all fours. That's another thing. The animal will walk on all fours, also on, all, on two. It's not um, limited to four feet, and it's not limited to two feet. You might think of the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. It's limited to using two, two feet, it's, it's hind feet. Its but, arms are too small. But also the tail would be a factor, wouldn't and it? And the tail would be a factor too, it's balance and everything. Uh, whereas a sauropod has these uh, big feet like um, an elephant feet in the front, elephant feet in the back, um, it feeds on all fours for the most part. You can tell that by the way it uses its feet. Well, this animal, Michele Membe, actually uses arms and alike feet. So when it walks on all fours, it walks on its uh, sort of its fist like that. So uh, Pete, how does this creature uh, dig these caves? I'm glad you asked. Um, the cave itself uh, is dug out mostly with the thumbs of the McKinley Membe. The uh, Baca describe it as looking something like a spoon. Here's uh, one of the um, casts that I uh, got from the caves and it has a, a definite shape like so. If you look at it this way you can see it's about two inches wide, three inches wide. Up in here it's probably about four or five inches wide. And this is what it uses as its thumb to dig the holes. Here's a uh, latex mold of one of these toes. That is what the uh, the holes that I was describing on the uh, cave entrance uh, looks like. It just looks like uh, something has, you know, stuck a shovel or something in there. But that's the toe that fits in there, like that. It's a uh, rather effective uh, tool because it's able to go through this material from the pictures um, on the cave entrance it's it's like almost like uh, it's uh, going through cookie dough I would say firm cookie dough you just uh, if I use my own hand I can't I can't move it if I was to use a shovel it would be ineffective it would just bounce off but that animal is able to penetrate the, the material and just scoop it out like so without much difficulty. So the material itself is, uh, is tough, but it still can be dug through if you have the right equipment. Well, especially if it's wet. And it, it may be wet at the end of the, uh, end of the wet season is when they dig these things. That whole area is probably uh, the right consistency for digging caves. Now, get back to the cave. The cave uh, is dug out this way and then goes sideways. This is about a hundred feet from entrance to entrance. So we're looking down from the top. We're looking here. down from the top now. From the side it looks like so. Dumping material in here. It goes down. It may, it may start in both ends and meet in the middle. I don't know. Or it could just be down like this. The Baca describe it as the animal will go into these caves into these tunnels and then come out the other side. So they're very, uh, it's, it's effective that way. If the water rises, it simply goes in and goes out. It doesn't really erode much. And then 
How does it close up the cave? This is speculation, but I think it's something like this. Keeping in mind there's a tail hole. I think the animal backs into this material, probably using its arms and its legs, much like a, uh, like a spade foot toad kind of covers itself or moves itself into a, uh, a depression to winter. Uh, it moves this material with its backside and with its tail out and pushes the material out this way, out into the water, out into the, the stream. And uh, down, looking down on it, the animal then, uh, its tail is out through this hole at about the water level and then simply walks, walks away, leaving this gap, this hole, both for relieving water pressure but also, uh, uh, it, its tail just naturally leaves that. It may me mean to, I don't know. But at any rate, it explains why the tail hole looks like it does. And uh, that would explain how it can open, or how it can close uh, the cave uh, during the dry season. It apparently, since it doesn't feed as much during the dry season, or doesn't feed at all, we don't know exactly how much it feeds. When I was there, it seemed to have fed rather recently, but there were these caves. There may be another entrance. I don't know. I can't explain some of these things, but there's some oddities that I do want to get into. Okay, now I'm going to talk about this hole that's in this pushed out material that's at the base and uh, part of the, uh, only a small part of the overall cave shape, okay? This, this place right here. A lot of people thought maybe that's the cave, or maybe they thought this part was the cave. This is, this area right in here is what I'm showing you right here. Okay, and you can see some of the toe marks. From the debris, you can see it's been here quite a while, probably weeks. Um, so this has fallen in here. These are the uh, digging areas that I got these uh, plaster casts molds from. Okay, and I wanted you to see uh, the overall shape of these things. You can see where it's been digging here. It's been digging here. It's been digging on the other side too. You can see the shape here. Uh, some of these shapes are very obvious, some are not so obvious. It was in the plaster cast stage where I was uh, pulling some of the plaster casts out and when the last cast came out I was using a machete. The machete is about that long, knife, about that wide, and uh, was scraping this material which is somewhat like cement and I heard a scrape on the other side. Uh, I was standing essentially three or four feet back from this so I was fairly close but I could tell that there was something scraping from the other side of this area somewhere up in here and it was scraping down like so or sideways I couldn't tell exactly but it was a scrape that might be if I was scraping with my machete would have been maybe three feet. So the thing was going like this, like it was signaling to me or telling me to get the heck out of there. I don't know what. But at any rate, it was quite audible and it got my attention. I said, Pierre, I said to the both of them, I said, do you hear that? Pierre said, get in the canoe, get in the Perot. And I was, my mind was, this animal is it back there. Let's go get it. I had no idea how big this animal was. I had no idea what danger that would be. I just wanted to dig it out. It was my first impression, and Pierre told us to just get in the boat, and we're getting out of here. It's probably a pretty good idea that we did. Next to this, up about this point here in the picture, was, were these, these scrape marks. Well, unfortunately, you don't, can't get a real good idea how long these scrape marks are. Well, I found this. I did uh, make a plaster cast of this. And this is one of the 
plaster casts of the scrape mark. So this would have been from about here to about here. So this was probably made by the big, by the big thumb, by the big uh, thumb mark, and scraped down here like this, if you can imagine. And you can see with this that we're talking about an animal, uh, as it was scraping down the side, was able to go into the, this, this cement-like material about, you know, an inch. And then there was one, two, three, and you can't see it here, but there was four and possibly a fifth scrape mark. The reason I mention the number is that this is a specific kind of animal. An animal that has three toes on its feet and five fingers on its hand, counting the thumb. If you want to count the thumb, it's not a finger, fine, it's got four plus a thumb. So, it's an animal with five and three. That is a specific kind of animal. Uh, in some ways we call them theropods. Uh, we also can call them ornithopods, that is bird-like some ways. So now I want to show you what I think the animal probably looked like. It looks something like this, and this is in proportion. This would be a six-foot person. The animal was probably ten times larger than I thought it was. I had no idea how big the animal. I thought maybe it was the size of a hippopotamus. A hippopotamus, hippopotamus would have been like so. Uh, the tail might not be long enough. The neck might, not, might be a little bit longer than that. But the general dimensions are about right. The digging tools are about right. The number of toes is about right, three and five. Something like that. Now I look, I imagined it feeding in, the, in that area where we found the uh, footprints. And I imagine it looks something like this, feeding up into the 20 feet up, which is proportionally about right, standing on its hind legs, with it using its front legs for whatever, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, here's the Malumbo uh, plant. That was what was there. That was the trees uh, that... Um, didn't have the fruit on it that time of year. Probably the reason they, they go into hibernation or go into these, uh, partially a reason why they go into these uh, caves is there's no food or the food is less than. But Anyhow, they do eat green things. They, they eat do greens. eat green things. So they malumbo uh, leaves, which are kind of juicy, uh, kind of looking leaves, fairly large. And they use all, they need also a malumbo fruit, which is, looks a lot like a, a prune, maybe not a prune. What do you call them? Plum. Yeah, a plum. Looks something like a plum, like a dried up plum, some ways. Um, and they're about that size. The throat pouch, uh, the the uh, the baka describe a throat pouch. So I I put striations here. I think this thing bulges out something like a. Uh, well, like a like a frog, when it's um, you know making vocalizations, but it actually fills it with fruit for later digestion, much like a, um, a squirrel or a chipmunk puts um, nuts into its uh, cheek pouches, but it would just be under this throat. But I thought that would distort the uh, look of the animal if I just uh, you know made a big thing out of that, but this is where the, the throat pouch would be. I'd like to talk now a little bit about the, uh, get an idea what the animal looks like. These of course are just conjecture. I think it's pretty close, but it might be wrong. I don't know. Uh, I wanted to talk about the footprints again. Right about, right about here, I found a footprint of the animal it was digging. And that footprint can be seen inside 
here. I wanted to show you this. This, this is a, a, a cast. This is the uh, rubber or latex mold for a footprint that I took. I don't have the, I don't have the plaster footprint in here, but I wanted you to see this general dimension of a foot that I found on the, uh, where did I show it? That I ha found right about here on the cave entrance, right about here, okay? And this is one of these, what, this is the footprint that I found. The dimensions of this are approximately 14 inches by seven and a half inches. This is a different footprint than the one that was across the way. This is a smaller animal. You'll notice the shape of it is more like this shape which would be the iguanodon shape. There are a lot of uh, theropods that have footprints like this. Not all of them have the heel pad. This animal was probably um, a smaller animal who was digging the hole. Okay, well, oh, so you're saying that this animal might have been outside the cave while the other ones were inside. Yes, and it's only come to me that this, this is the only explanation. There was actually another animal, perhaps re, it may not have been related to these. They may have been, it may have been from another family, or it may have been the, the younger a sibling, uh, not a sibling, but a, uh, uh, you know, a baby. It might have been a, a younger animal that for some reason wanted to get into where the father was or where the mother was. I can't come up with anything better as an explanation. It, it sounds reasonable, but it's not... I mean, we're really getting out there now. But the footprints are di different in, its, in their size. They're still a theropod. They're still making, uh, using a, a tool that's a fairly a large digging tool that defines it as something like an iguanodon. Not exactly, but something like like the pictures, and uh, it was actually outside at the same time these others were inside the caves. Now, something I hadn't brought up before because I wasn't sure myself, but only makes sense now, is that the night after we were there on the sandbar looking at the caves, looking at the footprints, that night I heard what I thought was the sound of slapping. At first, I thought it was slapping water, but far away. But then I thought it can't be slapping. Yeah, the, the, it can't be the animal itself because the animal is inside the caves. It must be shotguns because yeah. it, it sounded sort of like a shotgun. And then I heard it again, and I thought, okay, it's a shotgun. Well, at first, and still kind of makes sense that there's a shotgun over there, but it's 11 o'clock, you know, midnight. People don't go out in the Congo at midnight. You just don't do it. And they don't go out shooting or hunting. The yeah. only animal I can think of that would be out there at that time might be one of these Mekelimembes using its tail for, for signaling. We know that they use the tail to kill or or uh, intimidate hippopotamus. That's why the hippopotamus aren't there. We know it, that there are crocodiles around there. When I went back the second time with milk, there were crocodiles along the shore, especially in that area. I floated there myself. There are crocodiles all over the place. Well, this animal was signaling or, or beating off something. Whack! I mean, it sounded... It's a quarter of a mile away, and it sounded like a gunshot that was just maybe you know, a few hundred feet away. I'm trying to come up with explanations for that, but I didn't mention it before because I had no reason to mention it. I thought it was somebody using a shotgun, but 11 o'clock, you know, 11.30 at night, out shooting a shotgun? They don't even allow guns in, the, in that area. I was going to say It's illegal. That, yeah, I, I never saw any guns there. Uh, 
So you certainly would. wouldn't just go out there and start shooting. Makes no sense. Of course, how much sense does it make that there's a living dinosaur doing this side? You know, you probably think I'm crazy, but... Well, their tails, from what we know, are quite large. And they can develop a tremendous amount of force with them. Yeah. So that hitting the water would make a very, very loud sound. Now, the loud sounds, they would obviously use that for some purposes. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what those purposes are. Uh, but you're speculating that it might have been to warn other creatures of its own kind, that there's people around that are getting nosy. Uh, who knows? Who knows? I don't know. I'm just reporting what happened. So, um, the, as we were talking, you um, indicated that uh, the locals described this creature as a snake with legs. Mm -hmm. uh, how would that be differentiated from, say, a sauropod? Well, um, they've also drawn them with four feet, so it wouldn't. Uh, it, it still could be a sauropod, but the problem with the sauropod is that the sauropod has uh, four or five toes. Uh, four or five toes in the front, four or five toes in the back. Okay, there may be somebody out here who knows more about it than I do. Maybe it's only four. Maybe it's four and five, five and four, I don't know. All I know, it's more than three. These, had, these um, look kind of like, they may be thinner than what I've drawn here. Uh, they may be thinner, may have a thinner neck. I've heard that the neck was more like a snake. Maybe that's a little bit too thick for a snake. I've heard that the head is smaller than that. So the head may be smaller than that. The tail may be more shallow. It may be a little bit shorter, maybe. Um, but it uh, definitely has all the uh, signs of being an a ornithopod, which is a bird-like feet, three-footed, uh, three-toed uh, animal. Sauropods aren't like that. What about how big do you think this animal was? Well, Pierre estimated that it was a, a three-ton animal based on his footprint and his experience. Uh, I did some research into estimations of uh, body mass and um, it had to do with the uh, chest uh, circumference and, you, and, you, and the overall length. Well, if I use the overall length, which is about 30 feet, um, that would be a little bit deceptive. It's not a normal animal. You wouldn't take a sheep, for example, and have a long tail on a sheep. You wouldn't count the total tail of the sheep. What you do is kind of right from its butt to the end of its head, and that's its, that's its length, kind of a thing. So, I took sort of a, uh, a sort of an in between from here to about here, with this chest, and uh, the formula is the um, the ch the heart or chest area uh, circumference times itself times the length which I took from about here to about here. And that had an estimate of, uh, worked out to about 6,553 pounds. Just a little over uh, three tons. Uh, we looked at the uh, footprints, how far they compressed into the soil. Um, an average uh, horse, for example, has about 25 pounds per square inch. An average adult, about five or eight pounds per square inch. An elephant, 35 pounds per square inch. Are we in that vicinity by this estimation? And pounds per square inch for the back feet, for example, where we have the impressions, the footprints. And um, what it turns out to be is the estimated contact area of a McKelly Membe is about 100 square inches, that is, from the footprint. Therefore, a uh, total of 200 square inches for both feet. Uh, ground pressure would be estimated at about 32.77 pounds per square inch, which is right in the, right in the sweet spot. 
just about what an elephant is. How, how big is the, uh, how long is the uh, stride? Or do you know? I don't have anything on the stride. Uh, the hip width uh, for an elephant is between 42 and 78 inches. The hip width of this animal, the big animal on the island, uh, was about 56 inches. So it's right between. It's almost elephant-like in, in its uh, hip width. And that's about all I wanted to talk about there. <laughs>